I thought I'd talk about a paper, actually, that I was picked up on from somebody who pointed it to me on social media, which turned out to be rather interesting. It's a paper entitled, Is There Such a Thing as a Biosignature? What is a biosignature? They're one of those words that's going to be a big deal in the not too distant future. Um, and it's already kind of getting there. Biosignatures are signs of life. And in fact, it's a word that's used all over the place. It's used in you know, people who look kind of at, at the very early Earth to try and find the, the earliest signs of life on Earth. They look for biosignatures. But more specifically, in my context, people who look for life on other planets, they look for these things called biosignatures as confirmation that there is life on the planet they're looking at. I didn't know there was any doubt. I thought it was just an acknowledged thing that if we found a planet that had the right chemicals in its atmosphere, we might start jumping to conclusions. Uh, that, that's pretty much the thrust of the paper that actually what you'll probably start doing is jumping to conclusions. And it really is a question of, you know, what do we actually mean by a biosignature? Should we be a bit more careful about using the word and defining it a little more carefully? In particular, when you're communicating science to the world, there's kind of an issue that if you are using biosignature in a very specific technical sense and whoever picks it up in the media thinks you're saying you found life, then obviously, you know, there's a real potential for bad science communication there. So it's, a, it's kind of one of those things people need to think a little bit more carefully about than they have. So there's a figure in the paper which kind of really nicely illustrates, in fact, it illustrates things so nicely I made a bigger version of it. And it kind of goes through the process of what it is you're actually doing when you think you're finding a biosignature and asking the question what actually the biosignature is. Supposing there is some life somewhere, and so we have some theories about the way life ought to work. That's the way we work on these things. We've been wrong almost every time in the past, but maybe we'll be right this time. And one of the things that we think life probably does, if it's anything like life here on Earth, is that it probably produces oxygen. So if you produce oxygen, that's not life itself, but it's a sign of life. There's a question, you know, is that the biosignature then, the oxygen that you're producing? And at some level it is, but it turns out oxygen is really hard to observe. Uh, oxygen itself, you know, with, a, with the kind of telescopes we have now, it has very few transitions that you can actually observe. So it's a, a really awkward molecule to observe. We're talking about observing this presumably in the atmosphere of an exoplanet? Yeah, so if you're pointing your telescope at an exoplanet and splitting the light up into a spectrum, trying to find those, you know, spectral signatures of different chemical elements, turns out oxygen's a really hard one to find. However, ozone is quite an easy one to find. And one of the nice things we know is that by fairly sort of natural processes in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, so sort of photochemistry, so it's the interaction of light with oxygen, produces ozone. It's kind of a byproduct of there being oxygen. And so, and this is something that we can detect. Maybe that's what the biosignature is. But of course, we don't actually detect the ozone. We detect some features that are associated with the ozone, like the fact that it absorbs light at very particular wavelengths in the spectrum. And so the biomarker, you could say, is actually those features in the spectrum. But of course, that's not what we actually observe. What we actually do is we take a spectrum which kind of tries to measure those distributions of, you know, where there are dips in the, uh, uh, in the, in the brightness of the spectrum. So we actually have a spectrograph and we measure something we can actually get into a computer and analyse. And so the question that the paper quite reasonably asks is, you know, which of these things is actually the biomarker? To which there isn't really a good answer. If you're a, an observational astronomer, you'd probably say this last step is. If you're a biologist, you'll probably say that first step is. In parallel with that, there's something else you need to do, which is you need to convince yourself that whatever it is you're observing can't have happened through non-biological processes. So you need to do another whole load of work, kind of in parallel, looking at non-biological processes and what they will do to their environment. So for example, you might have lots of volcanoes. Volcanoes will produce lots of carbon dioxide but carbon dioxide doesn't spontaneously turn into ozone or oxygen. And so you can maybe convince yourself by doing this, you know, parallel work of saying, okay, so what would non-biological processes produce that, the, that, that you know, you've got a, a good signature because it's produced by biology and not by anything else. But again, the other thing this paper points out is in principle, you need to think of everything for this bottom line, right? All the possible non-biological processes. And we're not very good at thinking of everything. In fact, it's sort of fundamentally impossible to think of everything. And so all you can really do is do the best job you can. And it's a question of how good a job you have to do on this to really say that something's a biomarker. So there's these two things of where along this process the biomarker actually is, but also, you know, whether how good you've, a job you've done of ruling everything else out that you can say, you know, 100% sure if I see this, there's life or 90% sure if I see this in life, or 70%. So you, you, know, you have to somehow quantify how well you've done the other part of the job as well.
That looks like a reasonably thick paper to me. Is all they've said is, careful, it might be something else. They, yes, they use much longer words. Um, and they go, you know, obviously they, they, they do a whole load of analysis. For example, what, you know, one interesting thing, I said biomarkers, you know, bi biosignatures are kind of increasing of importance in science. And this is basically one of these measures of the frequencies of words occurring over time in journal articles or more widely. And you can see this is something which is just absolutely taking off. So they look at, you know, more of the history of it, more of how it applies in different fields, more how different fields use different words for the same thing in that, you know, I've several times slipped into saying biomarker because that's what I used to, the word I used to use. But people nowadays tend to use the word biosignature. And different fields use different words and actually even worse, they sometimes use the same word to mean slightly different things. So there's a whole load of kind of worrying about our use of language and how we're doing it that goes into the paper as well. Professor, I know this isn't your field of expertise, but you are an astronomer. What would it take to convince you that they'd found evidence of life on an exoplanet? A little green man waving up at the telescope. <laughs> I, I think, honestly, I think it's going to be one of those things where there's just going to be a kind of a weight of, of evidence builds up. So there's ozone, for example, is one thing. Turns out if you look in the infrared part of the spectrum, foliage is very good at absorbing at particular wavelengths and not others. So if you're looking at a planet which has loads of foliage on it, then there's a, again another signature you'd expect to see. So I think what's going to happen is just kind of the weight of evidence is going to build up. We found this biomarker and this biomarker and this biomarker. And so the whole thing kind of the, the evidence will build up slowly over time unless we really, you know, unless we start receiving radio signals or something from a clearly intelligent life that's very hard to think of any non-biological process that will produce them. I think it's going to be that kind of step-by-step uh, -step process of building up the evidence that there is life out there. Like, we hear all these things about exotic planets that might be out there where there are, like, diamonds in the clouds and, you know, gold on the surface and stuff. So another process that could produce ozone that's not biological seems very feasible to me. It does, and that's the problem, I think, you know, and especially since you have to consider so many exotic things which we're not used to because they're weird and wonderful things that the universe, you know, what we keep finding is that everywhere is different in the universe and there are many wonderful things going on in different places in the universe. Trying to think through what all those processes might be, I suspect is going to keep people busy for a long time. And, the, you know, the first thing you do when you found something you think is a clear biosignature is go back and do that really careful job of, is there any other way I can make this? So I think you know, there's a lot of work to be done on that non-biological side of ruling things out as well as the biological side of detecting the things that we think might be biosignatures. At the minute, but is there really any barrier to evolving intelligent life once you've started evolving life? Not really, it's more about time, isn't it? So let's keep going, let's keep going on to that. Now we've got intelligent life, what fraction of those can create a way of contact? How many of those develop, let's say, a radio telescope?